All right, hello and, and welcome everybody to this panel presentation titled Let's Talk Open Textbooks Author Q&A. Uh, my name is Mandy Goodset and I am the Performing Arts and Humanities Librarian as well as the Open Educational Resource and Copyright Advisor at Cleveland State University. And I'm really excited to introduce our panelists today. These are folks that I've worked with and I really enjoy working with them. I think they have really creative and interesting uh, projects to share with you all today. Um, a lot of these panelists have been through our, uh, the Michael Schwartz Library's um, textbook affordability grant program through our MSL Academic Endeavors publishing platform. Many of them have used press books, if any of our attendees are familiar with that. And so they should be um, able to tell you about those topics. Um, our textbook affordability grants, we've been offering them every fall and spring semester since 2016. And we are offering them again this semester. So if you're a faculty member at CSU and you're listening, and anything that you hear kind of sparks your interest, I really encourage you to fill out our intent to submit form. So a little bit new this year, we have a, a form where you can let us know that you're planning to apply. I'll set up a very brief meeting with you. We can talk through how to make your um, application as strong as possible. And then the final application deadline is April 28th. So I cannot multitask. So I will put the link in the chat when I'm done sharing my screen um, so that you can see how to apply for that. We do have some questions prepared for our speakers today, but we're very much interested in hearing from all of you. So as we go through, if you wanna pop your questions into the chat, we may not get to them immediately, but we'll get to them hopefully um, before we leave today, we set aside some time for audience questions. Uh, monitoring the chat with me is co-organizer of this event and wonderful colleague, Barb Loomis, who's the library's digital scholarly publication and programs administrator. Okay, I'm going Thank to briefly, um, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers and I'm going to keep their intro short <laughs> for the interest of time, but the full bios are available on our website. Another thing I will link to when I'm done sharing my screen here. Um, so I've just done this in alphabetical order by last name here. So we'll start with Dr. Abdullah Awuz, who is currently Assistant Professor of Management Information Systems at the School of Business in Central Connecticut State University, a position he has held since the start of this semester. Before he was at CCSU, he worked as a visiting lecturer in the Monte Ahuja College of Business at Cleveland State University for a year and a half. Abdullah's book, Project Management, Navigating the Complexity with a Systematic Approach, is the first book that MSL Academic Endeavors, our press here at the library, has undergone complete pre-publication peer review. His book should be finished around beginning of April, and when it's done, we will post it at the link that I will put in the chat. All right, Dr. Patricia Stoddard Dare. Uh, MSW PhD is a professor in the School of Social Work, Director of Women's and Gender Studies, and the co-coordinator of CSU's Chemical Dependency Counseling Certification Program. Patty's book, Introduction to Substance Use Disorders, is an excellent example of an open textbook that builds on the openly licensed work of others. All right, Dr. Kelly Renhaven is an Associate Professor of Classics in the Department of History at CSU and the Director of Classical Studies. Kelly has authored the book, Greek Gods, Heroes and Worship, and she co-authored the book with two of her colleagues in the department, Ancient World History to 1300 CE. And so that collaborative work she did, hopefully will allow her to share with us some of her interesting experiences with co-authorship and both books were authored in Pressbooks, so she may be able to tell us more about the Pressbooks platform. And last but not least, Dr. April M. York, a PhD CCC SLP, has been an assistant professor in the speech and hearing program at the, in the School of Health Sciences at CSU since 2016. April's book, Phonetics Workbook for Students of Communication Sciences and Disorders, has been downloaded, I think at this point, over 3,000 times, many, many times. And I think it provides a good example of the value of self-authored ancillary materials in addition to self-authored textbooks. 
So we are very fortunate this semester to be working with an excellent library publishing intern, Jameson Oakley. Jameson is currently a Neo MFA creative writing poetry student at Kent State University, where he's been a graduate teaching assistant since fall of 2020. And Jameson has been integral to the planning of this event. So now it is my pleasure to turn it over to him to ask our panelists some questions. So I'll stop sharing. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so for this first question, um, if you could please tell us a little bit about your authoring project and what motivated you to pursue it. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to go first. I'm happy to jump in and go first. Um, so I'm Patty Stoddard Dare. Nice to see you all. So I created an open ac access textbook for my theories and procedures and addiction studies class. Um, this class is offered at the undergraduate and graduate level. It's offered in the fall, spring, and summer of every year. It attracts non-degree and degree-seeking students who typically have a personal or professional interest in addiction counseling. Uh, my aim was to replace a very expensive textbook that we previously used in that class. So I'll talk more about this later, um, but my book was constructed by compiling, ed editing, deleting, reconfiguring, and adding to um, existing open access material. Um, I was motivated to pursue this project because I'm concerned about student debt, particularly for my social work students who don't have high income when they're done with their degree and they tend to have high debt anyway. Um, I attended a social work conference several years ago, which discussed how to create an open access textbook, um, especially using existing resources. And so I was inspired um, by that process. And um, the conference also that, that where I had first learned about it, they also conveyed that students are more engaged and more likely um, to complete their course readings if the course textbook is made free of charge. So I felt highly motivated um, and it also allowed me the freedom to have additional resources beyond just the textbook included in my class. In the past, if I asked students to purchase an expensive textbook, I was more reticent to in include other resources in the class because I felt like I was upsetting to the students because they invested so much in the textbook. Um, so it has really opened up a lot of possibilities in my class. So I'll talk more about it later, but that's just a brief overview of my project. I'll go. Um, I'm Dr. April York. I am a speech and hearing uh, speech language pathology professor. I teach phonetics, which is teaching students how to transcribe, write the sounds that we speak in any language of the world. Um, for that class previously, um, when I started five years ago, I found two textbooks, one that was a nice base level textbook and another that was a much more advanced textbook. And I found myself giving students assignments from both of those textbooks in order to get them to the level that I felt was appropriate. Um, <clears throat> There were some problems with that. One was that not everything matched up exactly between the two textbooks. Um, and um, so I had it had been nagging on me for four or five years that eventually I was going to need to create my own workbook for this class. And then the pandemic hit. And we saw lots of students who were going homeless. We saw students who were um, losing their income, you know, all of those sorts of things. And I decided it was time then to, um, to get this book out so that my students didn't ever have to choose between buying a textbook for my class and buying groceries. I can go. Hello, everyone. I'm Abdullah Oz. Uh, I'm not now in <laughs> Cleveland State University, but I'm still in Cleveland. So uh, it was an opportunity for me to uh, hear about the textbook affordability symposium in summer 2021. Then uh, I learned a lot during this symposium. Uh, in, indeed, at that time, 
No, I normally graduated from my doctoral program in 2020. So <laughs> I was still a student. Uh, actually, while you are in a PhD program, you don't need to buy textbooks. Generally, you know, you're using the articles mostly, but uh, indeed in one of my research classes, we use one open education resource. And uh, I really liked it a lot. And I also taught some classes during my PhD program. And uh, I know how students were trying to avoid buying uh, textbooks by uh, you know, going some websites <laughs> to, to just download them. So the, of course, some textbooks just have some uh, like um, online tools, but uh, it was really difficult for some of the students. Indeed, now I'm teaching at uh, uh, Central Connecticut and one, two students emailed me that they couldn't buy their textbooks. I needed to use textbook in my other two classes, uh, but you know, I, I can still see that students can even cannot afford 40 50 dollar textbooks so you know just forget about the, the ones that are more than 100 150 so uh, i try to help my students of course when they cannot uh, purchase these textbooks but this is a real problem and uh, for project management uh, there are some textbooks but they need to be updated so i'm hoping that I will try to fill in this gap with this textbook, but still for others like introduction to information systems and others, uh, we are still dependent on commercial textbooks and they are more expensive. So uh, this is my journey. And again, thank you very much to Mandy and Barb. They really uh, encouraged me a lot. And uh, that is all from me for now. Um, I can go next. Uh, my name's Kelly Renhaven. I'm a professor in the Department of History. And uh, I'm just going to say one thing right now about the textbook I wrote most recently. And that was the one for my Greek religion class, Greek Gods, Heroes, and Worship. Um, I decided I have a campus version of the course. And I wanted to create a web version because of the pandemic. It was easier to teach online for one semester. Um, and I wasn't very happy with the textbook that I had. It's difficult to find a good textbook on Greek religion. Um, at least for me, I haven't been able to find one I'm very happy with. So um, that's really the main reason why I made my own. I just put together articles um, that I thought with an introduction uh, for each chapter and several articles. I could add videos as well, documentaries. Um, and then every week, every module, there was a, a test based upon the reading material or the video. Um, and I just found it easier to, I could teach the way I wanted. I could teach the exact material that I wanted for every week. Um, also another, I didn't, I didn't want to be tethered to a textbook because we all know that new editions come out every few years. And if you have tests based upon textbooks, um, it can be, especially for a web course, it can be a real hassle to go and update the assessment material, um, page numbers and things like that. So um, that's, and that was another reason. I don't feel that I have to be updating all my tests every few years like I have to do with some of my other courses. Um, so I just felt it would give me more freedom. Plus, I want students to, to be engaging more with journal articles. Um, because I feel like there's a lot more material there than in the textbooks that I've, I've read, at least on Greek religion. So those were my reasons. Plus, of course, there's the affordability aspect. My students didn't have to worry about paying for a textbook, just, just like is a concern for all of us. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next question um, asks, how did you manage your time while creating an open textbook? And uh, if we can begin with Patricia again. So I was lucky. Um, I was on sabbatical um, and it was during COVID. So it was sort of in some ways an ideal time to work on it. So I started by finding an open, uh, open access book with a liberal creative commons license that I used as a jumping off point. And then I applied for a textbook affordability grant in the spring before my sabbatical began. And so this allowed me significant time during my sabbatical to work on the textbook every day. 
And so for me, I like to give myself artificial deadlines and I gave myself a deadline that was well before the end of my sabbatical period, um, just in case anything unexpected happened, which of course it did because of COVID. Um, so it all worked out just fine um, because I had so much time because of my sabbatical. So I would encourage people, you know, you can use teaching. Um, you can use your time for your sabbatical to improve your teaching. And I, I actually did it under that umbrella and it wound up being wonderful. For me, it was, um, I found myself getting a little annoyed with this and knowing that I would, uh, I, with the merging of the two textbooks. And so I found myself like over Christmas break, spending like a day and a half, just, <laughs> this is what it would look like, um, kind of in a, some somewhere between joy and frustration uh, balance there. And so then when spring came around and I saw the textbook affordi affordability grants and also my students were struggling with uh, uh, just finances in the pandemic, it was just good timing. Um, likewise, I, you know, I teach um, phonetics and I also have a lot of research students who follow me literally out in the field to help me do the interventions that I use to teach kids who can't talk to read and so I have almost always a lot of students with me and so the students um, helped me to write the textbook and so it allowed me to to really take a, a, a month and a half of time with students who had already had this class and and get something really great done. Uh, for me, <laughs> it's a tough question. <laughs> I I'm I'm behind my uh, deadlines. I think uh, you know, especially when you're teaching in <laughs> five sections. Oh, the information systems master pro master's program accepted lots of students, 200 students. So I needed to teach uh, five sections to 280 students in four semester. So it really challenged me. Uh, but now I think I am in a better position. So we, we finished more than half of the, the book. I think it would be better. And uh, one thing, you know, of course, uh, managing time is really challenging for me, but it also created some opportunities. First of all, now I'm using my completed uh, chapters in my class and undergrad project management class. And also another uh, instructor, uh, she's also using my textbook. So I'm providing the PDF documents and, sh and uh, indeed today I had an interview with another student from another section. Uh, it is her assignment. So uh, I learned that uh, she really enjoyed the, the textbook, my textbook, and she also gave me some feedback. So uh, now they are using it, but I, I hope that when we finish it and when it uh, becomes available public on the uh, internet, then others uh, will just start using it. So, uh, oh, the, another thing is that well, so these are lessons learned for me for the managing text, uh, managing the time. And a co-author would be great. <laughs> Rather than working as one person, I think, you know, we're normally working with co-authors in the research, in the articles, but for this textbook, I think that would be great to work with a co-author. Um, for, for me, I usually take a semester to develop a course and I usually, I have a lot of self-imposed deadlines. I have to stay very organized, otherwise I will not do anything. Um, so I have to make a schedule for myself. So I would give myself roughly a week to do each chapter um, so, or each module. So, and, and I find by the end of the semester, I have it finished um, and then I'm ready to teach the course. So, so lots of, lots of self-imposed deadlines. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so how has your decision to create an open textbook impacted your students? If anyone wants to go first or we can start with Patricia again. I'll go ahead, that's okay. So I made several changes to my class all at once. So it's difficult to pull apart the impact of having this open access textbook. But I can tell you overall, 
um, that my students are spending more time in Blackboard than they were previously. And the I'm not encouraging them to download the book. They're actually reading it while they're in the Blackboard shell. And, and I actually keep track and run weekly reports of how much time they're spending in Blackboard. So I'm thrilled to see that there's more time that they're spending in Blackboard. I also have observed that their grades are higher in my class. Um, again, there was a lot of different changes, so it's hard to attribute it exactly to this. Um, students in the past, they used to report to me, especially during the first three weeks of the semester, that they didn't have the textbook and they would ask for extension on assignments, say they couldn't complete their work, they were waiting for their financial aid to come through. Um, so this, that problem has been completely eliminated. And I think it's also helped to build rapport with students because they know that this book is um, my effort um, to try to do something to help them by making it free of charge. Absolutely, I would say very much the same thing that my students know that this is my effort to help them. I, you know, a lot of our students here at CSU are first generation college students who are pulling themselves out of poverty and I having grown up in that same situation or similar situation, um, I'm very sensitive to that. And I think it's put your money where your mouth is kind of thing. My students know that I truly care about them. And one of the ways that they know that is because I've created a textbook that they don't have to pay for. And also um, because it's I created it, when students are at home and one of my students said it's like you know when they're doing their homework in the text in the workbook it said it's like dr york's right beside me doing doing my homework with me and so they can feel my support and the love that i have for them when they're doing these assignments yeah uh, for me uh indeed my students some of my students ask me, you know, if they can help, especially the master uh, master students here at uh, CSU. Uh, indeed, I sent uh, two of them uh, some of my chapters to give me feedback. But I see that they welcomed very well. They 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 really liked it. Uh, even though they took the class from me, uh, they wanted me to share uh, the link later when I finish it. And I think especially as most of my students from abroad, especially you know, now at uh, Masters of Information Systems program at Cleveland State, and also the computer uh, science part, 90, 95% of students are from India. And then just multiply this $100 by, I don't know, 60, 65 rupees. So it is becoming more expensive for them. So they really uh, like the idea that someone is creating uh, an open educational textbook, which is free for them. And uh, as Patricia and April said, they, they, they know that we are caring for them. So uh, they really uh, value what we are doing. And uh, I, as I said, also my new students at Clean uh, at Central uh, Connecticut, they also really value, and I also get some feedback from them. Um, I agree with uh, what everyone else has said. I don't have much more to add, you know, um, other than I think uh, my students are very clear about. Uh, you know, what I want them to do, because every single, you know, we're able to add all of our instructions in every single um, chapter of the book, you know, um, and I have them read this first, then think about this and read this, you know, it does, I think, feel even though it's a web course that I wrote my book for, um, I think I, I felt like I had more control over the direction of their learning. Um, and, and they did, I was happy. I've only taught this online once this course with this test textbook. So I don't have a lot of feedback yet. Um, but my students, I was impressed that they, most of them got A's and B's in the course. I'm um, using these, te the textbook that I wrote, I'm speaking about the Greek religion one. Um, and, uh, for the one that I wrote, I'll talk more about this later, but the one I wrote with two other professors, um, again, we did find that the by the second year after we'd added a bit more to the book and everything, it's an online course as well, um, that we had uh, better grades uh, than the first time we taught the course. So I think I, I just felt I feel more in control writing my own textbook 
and uh, I think the students feel like we're a lot more involved with the direction of their learning as well. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, if you could tell a new open textbook author who is just starting the process one thing, what would it be? I would say just give it a shot. You know, you're not making a commitment just by trying. So I have a second open access book that I'm hoping to write. So far, I've only opened the, the press bookshelf. Just taking one step at a time leads to a completed goal over time. Uh, one of my mentors told me a long time ago, if you can write a page, you can write a book because you only have to write one page at a time. So I say, just see what, see what you got in you. I agree. That's basically what I did. <laughs> I found myself over Christmas break, like, just putting my ideas together. And then when, when summer came and I had a team of students to help, we just did it. And, and you know, and, and, and I know not all, it's a workbook, which makes it easier in lots of ways, but I think that that's true. And I think I was really surprised how, how used this textbook is. Um, you know, there's been 3,000 downloads across the world. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I thought I was writing an American English textbook, but apparently people in China and Japan and all over the world um, are seeking these resources that I thought I was writing for speech therapy students. Uh, as I told, I think, you know, not, everyone needs a quarter <laughs> but i think uh you know of course i totally agree with patricia and april but i think if if you you know i'm using the other open education resources but i'm also trying to create new things like you know microsoft project tutorials and other things so especially to motivate the another person i think if you want you can have a quarter or you can also work with your students. Students are, are really help. And I know that from other open education resources that, you know, I even know one of them, they didn't want the, the authors to be revealed. I think they worked collectively. So it may be also a collective uh, job. I was like, what? <laughs> um, okay, so, 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 um, if I could just add, one or say one thing is not as inspiring as what everybody else has said, um, but check the links. <laughs> um, just double check um, to make sure that everything is working because if I've had one issue, it's that people are clicking links and things disappear, videos disappear. Um, it, I've ha had an issue with, um, I wrote some of it while I was on campus and added links and then I added links when I was at home. Um, and realize that you should use the proxy links um, and assume that people are not on campus when they're accessing the material and they're, they have to log in. So um, I, I found some technical issues that way that can be very, very frustrating for students when they go to access the material and they're clicking and they can't get in. So I've learned um, to download stuff onto Vimeo. That way um, YouTube can't erase my videos on me. Right. Good idea. Yeah, I kept PDFs of all my journal articles and then I, I gave my class, I put it on the Blackboard page, a link. I kept the folder on OneDrive and I gave them a link so that they could access files that way as well in case they had trouble with the links. All right, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Barb now. She has some questions. Thanks, Jameson. Yes, thanks everybody. Um, this is for Abdullah. Um, what is your experience with peer review in terms of creating your own open textbook? Thanks, Barb. It's a real grief. Uh, it's a real relief, not grief. <laughs> it's a real relief for me. You know, they really helped me. I don't know who they are, <laughs> but uh, for instance, one of the reviewers who reviewed, I think, my first chapter or first chapters, uh, they told me that that would be good to create an overall case study, a case study, like a framework case study that I can use for all the uh, uh, book. Indeed, I was thinking of some case studies, but I was not thinking of a one case study. 
uh, in project management, uh, when you check the commercial textbooks, they are using that kind of case studies. So I tried, I decided to create one. And indeed, I decided I created that one just based on the pandemic, declining sales for groceries, and they're trying to create a mobile commerce website. So then the students can understand better. So it really helped me. This was only one example, but the older, you know, I, I changed a lot in the uh, chapters based on the reviews that I got from the reviewers. And I know that I will get uh, very good uh, reviews again for the upcoming chapters. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you had such a good experience with that. Um, so my next question is for Patty. Um, what advice do you have for faculty who would like to build on existing openly licensed materials? And can you speak about the value of not starting from scratch? Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, so there's no need to recreate the wheel. Um, some areas, there's already existing open access materials that you can use. So look to see what's already out there to see what you can use as a foundation. Um, the librarians can help to find those types of resources. They also can help you to learn what the different types of licenses mean. So I wasn't familiar with the different terms. I used a CCBYNC, which was a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial License, um, which allowed, I was allowed to take resources from another author, edit and change it, and then, um, and then publish it myself. So um, I selected a book that had that kind of license. Um, and then the librarians, they helped me to um, pour the existing foundational material into the Pressbook site to help me get started. Um, starting from scratch definitely, not starting from scratch definitely has um, pros and cons. Um, so the, the pro is of course, it helps you get started. It helps it so you don't have to recreate things that are already existing. Um, but there's, you know, I think that we all know that editing work can be more difficult than just going ahead and starting from scratch. Um, so it's it wasn't a quick endeavor. Um, it was probably more time consuming than I thought it was going to be. Um, but building on previously published content allowed me to focus my efforts on customizing the content for my class. Um, so some of the basic content was there. I just needed to edit it but I also could spend my time adding content that I deemed was important that wasn't there um, and adding that um, to it. So overall, I thought it was a fun process. Um, it kind of doubled in size, um, the, the, the size of the original textbook. I'm friends with the original author. Uh, we worked on a project together, so she's just absolutely thrilled to see that her work has been extended. Um, and, and I'm also part of, I'm part of a, a, a grant through the Council on Social Work Education and SAMHSA. Um, I think that working in substance use counseling, it's an area that has a lot of open access materials already because there's just a lot of grant funding around particularly the opioid epidemic. And so um, I'm, collect I'm connected with a lot of colleagues who are very interested generally in creating all sorts of curricular resources that are open access. Um, not just a textbook. So I think it for me, anyway, it was a, a very ripe open field and there was a lot of goodwill um, extended in my direction um, for wanting to do this type of work. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, I'll hand it off to Mandy now. Okay, we have a couple more questions, um, but if anybody is thinking of questions, any of our audience members, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my question is for Kelly. Can you describe your experience co-authoring a textbook with other faculty? Um, yeah, sure. Um, there are lots of good things that came out of it. I got to know my colleagues better. Um, we all work in different ways as well as we came to find out. I think anyone who's team taught a course can see that we all have very different ways of teaching. Um, uh, so we learned a lot from each other for sure. Um, I think it's really important to meet regularly. We found that um, at first we weren't meeting as much. Um, and then as time went on, we started to meet more um, to discuss what we wanted to do, what the other had done. Um, consistency was very important to us because we taught, there were three of us teaching one course over one semester. 
So we didn't want students to have a completely different experience with each of us, even though we all have different ways of teaching. So it was very, very important to agree on parameters for all of us to work within. So we'd have as much consistency as possible um, for the students. So we each had a five week block. Um, so, and to read over each other's material to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to how we're structuring the chapters. Um, so that's, that. it's a lot of, um, I think it's more work really collaborating with other people than doing something on our own. Um, so being organized and very open and very honest and um, supportive of each other because um, not everyone had the same kinds of skills in certain areas. So it's important to make sure to make, to help each other. So it was a real learning experience for us. And I think it made us all better and stronger in a lot of ways as well. Um, so it's just amazing how much we can learn from each other. You know, when, when we see each other's teaching, when we read each other's work, um, because we tend to work in our own little, well, at least in my field, um, not, not in other fields necessarily, but we tend to work in our own little spaces and maybe we don't reach out as much as, as we could and learn from each other. So um, yeah, it was a very, very useful experience. Yeah, I think no matter what field you're in, I think it can be scary mm -hmm. to share your teaching with other people. Um, yeah, because yeah. teaching is difficult. And very personal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, here's a question for April. What role did students play in helping with your project and how did their participation impact their learning? For me, I... I love working with students, particularly undergrad students. Grad students tend to be really, really busy, whereas undergrad students have time and they really want to grow. And so they're seeking opportunities. And so for me, this textbook was really just an extension of the mentoring process that I had already been using. So students take my phonetics class, they literally follow me out the door into the schools. I'm like, seriously, literally, I look like Mother Goose, um, <laughs> follow me out the door, out into the schools, help me provide these interventions. So by the time I had written this, I went to write this textbook, I had about 25 students that were out in the field with me during the school year, and about five or six that either were taking my, um, spending time with me as a McNair scholar or as a uh, through volunteering or through, does that make sense? Through a variety of different sources. And so they were there and these were students who had already taken my phonetics class. They knew how to transcribe. They knew how to, they knew all the skills. And so I created the framework and the students were amazing. You know, I created the framework of what letter, what um, symbols we were teaching what day and how to set it all up. And I found a, a book with a million different words in it and the students just found the words and transcribed them. And I'm not very detail oriented. I'm not a type A personality like at all. Um, and my students like organized all the pages and made sure that they looked uniform and all of those sorts of things that are weaknesses for me, my students um, kind of compensated for my deficits. Um, so I'm really grateful for them and uh, have included their names on the textbook for that reason. Yeah, I think it's a really great example of um, kind of accomplishing two positive things at once because they're getting this cool experience, but then you're also getting material that can be used in the future too. So And they become amazing at transcription. They were yeah, already right. really good, but anything that they had lost between when I taught my class and this was regained mm -hmm. in space. It's good practice. I'll just briefly mention one of our other faculty, Candace Vanderweert, who is in management, did another cool project with her students and students at Virginia Tech. They both wanted to use this open textbook, but there weren't enough quiz questions. There weren't because it was not a commercial book. So they had their students as an assignment, develop the quiz questions, they reviewed them, and they have a test bank of like a thousand questions now to pull from every semester. So that's like another way that we're kind of accomplishing two things. Ha developing quiz questions is kind of a way of learning the material. And now other students can benefit from that too. Um, all right, we have one question in the chat. 
And I can tackle this unless one of our panels wants to as, as a copyright person. If uh, to get some articles still with copyrights, where did you get the funds to purchase the rights to use them? And we did not purchase rights to, um, to share any copyrighted content. We, if we use copyrighted content, we link to things. Linking is your friend. <laughs> Linking is okay uh, to, you know, to library license content. Um, I don't know if any of our panelists have more to say about that. Um, I I heard uh, I think I heard from you, Mandy, when I had put in my Greek religion textbook. I had actually added articles, journal articles, and sections to books that were licensed through the library, and I was advised to remove them because of copyright issues. Um, so instead, what I did is I just put the link in the proxy link. So if this is one of our students, they can log into the system and access the material, and then there's not a copyright issue. And then I just kept, a, like I said before, a folder of articles, but only my own class could access those because they had to log in to, to use OneDrive um, through CSU. So there, I had a bit of a glitch there. Um, so I won't, I won't do that again. I wasn't aware of that myself that I, that I couldn't do that. So, um, yeah, we learn as we go. Right. And I should say, so I'll put this in the chat to some extent it's, we can rely on fair use. It seems like, you know, we, we are not, we don't even think about fair use because we're using open materials or it's copyrighted, so we have to hide it, but we can rely on fair use with this stuff. And so um, in the past year or so, uh, this um, group of librarians and law scholars have put together a code of best practices for fair use in open educational resources, and I really highly recommend looking at it. Um, but your librarian can probably also help you <laughs> with those kind of questions as well. I don't know, did that answer your question, hopefully? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Anyone else have questions? That was a good one. If anyone, I put this in the chat, but if anyone is here and you're a librarian from another institution and you're curious about our peer review process, this is something that we developed over the past year. Um, and we, we actually were able to secure some funding. So peer reviewers get paid, uh, but it was difficult to figure out how to do it. So if you have questions and you're interested in that, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to share all the lessons we learned. I actually am interested in that. I've um, reached out to some of the, you know, kind of looked on the map and figured out which schools are using my uh, phonetics workbook and reached out to them for reviews, but I'm not sure what other method there is to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And we can talk about it. So like for Abdullah, he wanted to use blind peer review. Mm -hmm. So that's a little more difficult after it's published. Um, and we did a lot of work to kind of hide identities and stuff, but post-publication review is very possible. Um, and there are actually some places where you can find materials where it's very easy to find post-publication peer review, like the open textbook library. Um, but yeah, we should talk about that and we can talk about reviewing. I also really love what Abdullah has done, like having students review the content. I think that's so, such a great idea because they are the end viewer. They're the reader that you're kind of hoping to reach. So that's certainly something that's pretty easy to organize is having students read the text, not just to like do their homework, but to give you feedback on, um, on whether they like it and how much they understand it and that sort of thing. Other thoughts or questions? Hope this was useful to you. I learned a lot and I worked with all of you. Okay, great. Questions from Jeff. Are your open textbooks available outside of your course for students to use or review before your course starts so they can get a head start on preparing for your course? One question. And if so, how do people find your textbooks? Um, I have an answer, but I'm going to let I'll tell you how I do it. 
I always send an email out to my students about a week or so um, before class. And in that I say, you don't need to buy a textbook. <laughs> um, I don't want you guys spending money on my textbook rather than, um, than on groceries. And um, in that I put the link and you know say, for my class phonetics, they're gonna be writing on it. So I say, please print this out before class starts and those sorts of things. And Jeff, to your, like, um, so April, that's April's book that people in China and Japan were finding. We put that in our institutional repository and we have Beat Press. So that really extends the, the reach of the, the text to a lot of people. And that's how we can see <laughs> where people are downloading it. I don't know. Does anybody else want to answer that one? I find myself mesmerized with the map every month. I'm like, wow. I send an email to my students, um, but I, I send it like a month ahead of time because my students are really engaged early <laughs> and they want to know um, about the textbook. So, for example, I would send it like in, you know, early December for a spring class. Or then I would send it again a week before the class starts and then the day that the class starts as well. And it's okay. on the syllabus. And then you said another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do that too. I send multiple messages to my class in all different forms, um, Blackboard announcement, email, campus net, um, you know, different ways, teams, you know, just to make sure everybody gets the message. And as far as our, um, just like our collection of open textbooks that we've published, you can see Barb put a link in the chat. That's our that's our institutional repository. So we try to put all the material there. And then of course, there are lots of other places that you can index the material like the Open Textbook Library and OER Commons. And so we do our best to index things there. But yeah, obviously for students, the best way that they're gonna find out about it is if their professor lets them know. Jeff, did that kind of answer your question? Great. Other questions? Well, I'm not seeing anything else. So maybe I will wrap up here. I want to say a huge thank you to our panelists. This has been really wonderful. And I think personally, really inspirational. Um, we don't have a survey for this event. But we'd love to hear your feedback in the chat or if you want to email us um, what you liked about this event or suggestions for the future. Um, we'll kind of stick around here if anyone has anything to share. Um, but again, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to Jameson for helping with the questions and to Barb. And everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Thanks for coming, you guys.